Now that we've beaten the culinary analogies into the ground, let's look at a specific chemical example of a limiting reactant problem. So here we have a, a given balanced chemical equation between silicon solid and nitrogen gas to form silicon nitride. And the question here is, given these masses of reactants, 2 grams of solid silicon and 1.5 grams of solid N2, which of these reactants limits the maximum possible amount of product that can form? In other words, which of the two reactants is the limiting reagent or limiting reactant? And so let's go ahead and throw those masses down here at the bottom. And what we essentially need to do here in the overall process is figure out how many moles of reaction events each reactant can do, the silicon and the nitrogen. And we can kind of think of these separately, assuming the other reactant is in excess, as we did previously, for example, with making pancakes and the various ingredients involved there. So how do we go from a mass of a reactant to the moles of reaction events that that reactant can do? Well, first, we need to convert that mass of reactant into a moles of that reactant. So, for example, going from grams of silicon to moles of silicon and grams of N2 to moles of N2. Once we have the moles of silicon and moles of N2, we can then move to the moles of reaction events using the balanced chemical equation, as we will see here shortly. So, now we've kind of diagrammed out our, our process. Let's get into the nitty-gritty of actually calculating out the numbers. To go from grams of silicon to moles of silicon, we're going to multiply by the moles per gram of silicon or divide by the molar mass, grams per mole of silicon. And then to convert the moles of silicon into the number of reaction events that that silicon can do, we multiply by this ratio. How many moles of reaction events can I do per silicon that I have around? Similarly for N2, we're gonna follow an exactly analogous process first multiplying by the moles of N2 per gram of N2, and then taking the moles of N2 that results and multiplying by this mole ratio of the number of reaction events I can do per N2. So let's start with the actual numbers now. So two grams of silicon. The molar mass of silicon is 28.09 grams per mole. So I'm multiplying by one mole of silicon for every 28.09 grams of silicon. And then the mole ratio here, this moles of reaction events per mole of silicon, comes from the balanced chemical equation. Specifically, what we can see based on the three right here is that for every one mole of reaction events that takes place, three moles of silicon are consumed. And this is where this molar ratio comes from, right here. When we calculate this out, we end up with 0 0.0237 moles of reaction events that this two gram sample of silicon can do. And we're gonna call this XSI. It's the number of reaction events that the silicon can do. Now we follow the exactly analogous process for nitrogen. First dividing by the molar mass of nitrogen, which is 28.01 grams per mole of N2. And so we're multiplying by one mole of N2 for every 28.01 grams of N2. And then we again use the balanced chemical equation, specifically the coefficient in front of the N2 now, to figure out how many moles of reaction events this sample of nitrogen gas can do. And so here we're multiplying by one mole of reaction events for every two moles of N2, since two moles of N2 are consumed per mole of reaction events. And here we end up with 0 0.0267 moles of reaction events and this is our X into the number of reaction events that the N2, this 1.5 gram sample of N2 gas, can do. Now, to determine the limiting reactant, we look for the smaller of these two numbers. Think back to the pancake analogy where we looked for the smallest number of pancakes I could make for each ingredient. We're doing something highly analogous here. So what we're gonna do is compare the XSI to the XN2 and look for the smaller of the two. What we find here is that the XN2 is larger, 0 0.0267 is larger than the 0 0.0237 XSI, and this means that silicon is the limiting reactant. Given these amounts of reactants, I can only do 0 0.0237 moles of reaction events, and I'm going to have some leftover and two at the end of the reaction after all the silicon is consumed. Now that we know that silicon is our limiting reactant, 
we can calculate the theoretical yield of silicon nitride really using that limiting number of reaction events as kind of the centerpiece to this calculation. And so what we know is X lim. This is X si that we calculated on the last slide, the number of reaction events that the silicon, the limiting reagent, can undergo. And where we want to go is the mass of silicon nitride product. Now, like all things stoichiometry, we're going to need to go through moles to get to mass. And so an intermediate goal in this type of problem is going from that limiting number of reaction events to the moles of SI3 and 4, the moles of product that will form when that number of reaction events, that X lim moles of reaction events, takes place. So let's kind of diagram our way through this calculation now. How do we go from the moles of reaction events to the moles of product formed? Well, we use a mole-mole ratio with the moles of product in the numerator and the moles of reaction events in the denominator. And to figure out how we're going to set this up numerically, what numbers should go into this ratio, we're going to use the fact that in the balanced chemical equation, SI3 in 4, the product, has a coefficient of 1. One mole of SI3 in 4 is formed for every one mole of reaction events. Here I've abbreviated reaction events as RE. This will tell us the number of moles of SI3 in 4 we should expect theoretically. And to go from moles to grams, well, this is a familiar calculation, multiplying by the molar mass, the grams per mole of SI3 and 4. So let's start plugging in some numbers now. We know from the last slide that XSI is our limiting number of reaction events. It was the smaller of those two numbers of reaction events that we calculated, and it was 0 0.0237 moles of reaction events. We start with that, and we multiply by this mole-mole ratio, one mole of SI3 and 4 formed for every one mole of reaction events that takes place. And remember that entire calculation hinged on this one in front of SI3 and 4 in the balanced chemical equation. That tells us the moles of SI3 and 4, which is of course numerically equivalent to the number of moles of reaction events. We then take that number of moles and multiply by the molar mass of SI3 and 4, which happens to be about 140 grams for every mole of SI3 and 4. And when you multiply all of this out, you land on 3.32 grams of SI3 and 4. And this is our theoretical yield of SI3 and 4 given the reactant amounts in the problem, 2 grams of silicon and 1.5 grams of N2. Now, from here, you could go on and calculate the amount of N2 remaining uh, in excess. One interesting thing I'll point out, though, here is that you can use conservation of mass to determine this as well without doing too much more work stoichiometrically, realizing that the mass of the entire reaction is 3.5 grams, right? And the mass of all the products, including any excess reactant left over, cannot exceed 3.5 grams. That's the law of conservation of mass. And so if everything goes theoretically smoothly, right, and the amount of N2 remaining is all of the unreacted N2, this means that the remaining, what would this be, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.18 grams of material has to be excess N2. You could calculate this another way, using the limiting number of reaction events, figuring out how much N2 was consumed and subtracting from what you started with, but if you did that calculation, it needs to line up with the fact that we cannot have more than 0 0.18 grams of N2, excess N2 remaining since the total mass of the reaction mixture is 3.5 grams. That's a little trick for limiting reagent problems that you can use to save yourself a little bit of time. Reactions have to obey conservation of mass, and so the excess reactant's mass is limited by that fact. In that last problem in calculating the amount of silicon nitride we would get out given the initial conditions, what we calculated is called the theoretical yield, the hypothetical maximum amount of product given the law of conservation of mass, essentially, that all of the limiting reactant is consumed. And so, for example, going back to our pancake situation, the theoretical yield of pancakes given these conditions is 16 pancakes, right? Since I've got double the amounts of the ingredients listed in the balanced recipe, I can get twice the amount of product out, right, theoretically. And this assumes I don't 
drop any batter on the floor and I'm scraping all the batter out of the bowl and, and all that good stuff. I don't burn any pancakes and have to throw them away, anything like that. If anything goes wrong, and in chemistry, something always goes wrong, um, the percent yield is a measure of how well we did relative to the theoretical. So let's say we actually made some pancakes and we ended up with 12 rather than 16. Well, in that case, our percent yield is the ratio of the number or amount that we actually obtained. And in chemistry, that can be in mass or in moles. Mass is very common divided by the theoretical mass or mole yield. The theoretical yield of pancakes was 16. We made 12. Our percent yield thus is 75%. So percent yield is for an actual reaction, but it does require theoretical yield in the calculation since that's the denominator of this calculation, percent yield. And so doing limiting reagent and theoretical yield are kind of prerequisites to calculating a percent yield in a number of cases. We'll often be given initial conditions and a final condition corresponding to an actual reaction that was run and we'll have to go through the limiting reactant theoretical yield calculation and then at the very end take that actual yield of product and set up a ratio to calculate percent yield. Let's go through this process now in the context of a specific example. Upon reaction of 1.274 grams of copper sulfate with excess zinc metal 0.392 grams of copper metal were produced according to the balanced chemical equation here. And the question is, quite simply, what is the percent yield of copper metal based on these kind of input parameters, if you will? The key pieces of information here are the mass of copper sulfate reactant, copper 2 sulfate reactant used. The fact that zinc is in excess is important. This means that copper 2 sulfate is, is limiting by definition. Right? If I've got two reactants, and one of them is in excess, the other is necessarily limiting. That'll simplify our lives later. 0.392 grams of copper metal was produced. This is the actual yield, the actual mass yield of copper metal, and more than likely it will not equal the theoretical yield, in, uh, which will result in our percent yield differing from 100%. It may be greater than or less than 100%. And the question is, what is the percent yield of copper metal? Being less than 100% is normal. If we know we're dealing with pure copper metal, we lost some in purification or lost some in the bottom of the reaction vessel, something like this. The balanced chemical equation is critical in the fact that there's a one-to-one -one ratio between copper two sulfate and copper solid in this reaction is gonna be important for us as we calculate things moving forward. So, Let's again set up our stoichiometry flow before we actually plug in numbers. Where we're starting is with a given mass of copper sulfate, copper two sulfate. We actually know that's limiting, right? So we don't have to go through the rigmarole of figuring out what the limiting reagent is. The fact that excess zinc is used tells us that copper two sulfate is limiting. And where we want to go is the theoretical yield, the theoretical mass yield of copper corresponding to that number of grams of copper two sulfate. So really, this is just a reactant to product stoichiometry conversion type of problem. In order to do this, we go to moles first, moles of copper sulfate, use a stoichiometric factor to go from copper sulfate to copper, and then a molar mass to go from moles of copper to mass of copper. So we've seen this before. Divide by the molar mass, use the corresponding stoichiometric factor. Here it's one mole of copper for every one mole of copper two sulfate, one mole of copper produced for every one mole of copper two sulfate consumed, and then we're gonna multiply by the molar mass of copper. So quickly to go through the actual numbers, 1.274 grams of copper two sulfate, divide by the molar mass or multiply by the moles per mass. The stoichiometric factor is one to one. We're now at moles of copper and we multiply by the molar mass of copper or the average atomic mass of copper, if you like, 63.55 grams per mole. And that gets us to 0 0.507 grams of copper. So we actually managed to avoid a limiting reactant calculation. If a mass of zinc were given here, we'd have to go through the process of figuring out the limiting number of reaction events based on the reaction events corresponding to the zinc and to the copper to figure out which are, was our limiting reagent. So that's our theoretical yield. This is our M-theo of copper for the reaction 0.507 grams. 
it's not that surprising that the 0.392 is less than this number. To find the percent yield, we take that actual value, which I've highlighted here in green, and divide it by the theoretical, and then multiply by 100%. And that gives us 77% yield of copper. Now, I'll, I'll end here just by saying, as an organic chemist, as someone who has run a lot of reactions in my day, you don't want to report percent yield to more precision than the ones place. Stop at the ones place. Some people would say, don't even do the ones place. Do 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Do multiples of five. Because percent yield is highly variable in practice. And so even though we've got the significant digits to add one more digit to the percent yield, that extra digit has no meaning since repeating the reaction would result in a yield very different from this in that tenths place. You know, 77 point whatever, what follows the decimal point has no meaning since it's completely imprecise. So keep it at the ones place, especially if you want to keep your organic chemistry instructors happy.